Part 1. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You will hear the recording once only. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 4. OK, who's next please? I think I am. How can I help you? I just came in on flight 372 from Singapore at 11.30 and my luggage hasn't arrived. I've been waiting at the baggage claim for about half an hour now and everything seems to have come off the plane. The conveyor belt has stopped and all the passengers have gone. So I came here to find out what has happened to my bag. Can I see your ticket please? Here it is. So you came from Hong Kong today and changed planes in Singapore, right? Yes, the connection in Singapore was a tight one. The plane got in late and I had to rush to get to the next flight. That's the problem right there. There wasn't enough time to get your bags onto the connecting flight. Normally, Singapore Airport is very efficient. Now, I need you to fill in these forms. Your name? Jenny Lee. Address? I guess you want my address here. I'm staying with relatives. Just a minute, I'll have to look it up. It looks like 583. No, it's 533 East 67th Street in Riverside. Do you have the phone number there? Yes, I do. It's um, 9301 4269. So you came in on Qantas Flight 392. Do you know the number of the flight out of Hong Kong? Let me see. I think it was Cafe Pacific 900 or something. Oh, yes. It says here. CX912. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Right. Now, I need a description of the luggage. How many pieces did you check in? Just one. Can you describe it for me? Here is a picture to help you. OK. It's a big bag, like this one. Rectangular. Not hard shell, but soft covered. And it has a zipper around the front. Is it black? No, sort of a grey colour. Any identification? Just a tag with my name on it. Any other features? Well, it has wheels and a retractable handle on the end, so you can pull it, as well as the handle in the middle. OK, that's fine. Now, if your bag missed the connection, I'm sure it'll be put on the next flight. I'll email Singapore as soon as I finish here. The next flight comes in at 17.50. That's 10 to 6 this evening. You can pick it up then. 10 to 6? That's too long to wait. Can I get my uncle to pick up the bag on his way home from work? Sorry, you have to be here yourself to clear customs. Of course, I almost forgot. Will the bag come here, to this desk? Yes. You pick it up here, then take it over to the customs area. By the way, don't forget to bring your passport. You will also need to have the key plus your ticket with a baggage claim number on it. Oh, OK. Guess I'll have to come back tomorrow then. It's lucky I packed everything I need for now in my carry-on bag. Yes, that's always a good idea. Be prepared. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute 
to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a man talking about living and working on Trinidad. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, I'm Steve Pinfold and I'm here today to tell you about my gap year, which I took about 20 years ago. Unlike many students these days who go travelling or get some work experience between school and university, I decided to do something completely different after finishing my degree. I applied to work for a charity organisation. What it does is it sends people with particular skills to countries where those skills are needed. Apart from having some experience teaching English to summer school students, I didn't have any particularly useful skills, I thought, but luckily I was still accepted. I had to find the money for the flight, but you get free accommodation, I stayed with a family of five. And you do get paid, but not much. It's a bit like pocket money, enough to get by. I worked in an orphanage and taught English at a local school. Where was I? Well, originally, I was going to be sent to a village in India, but at the last minute, the organisation decided to send me to Trinidad. Now, this is a fascinating place. It's an island in the Caribbean. Well, in fact, the country is actually two islands. The smaller one is called Tobago, which is connected somehow to the word tobacco. Anyway, there I was, a young white guy living and working on an island which is mostly a mixture of descendants from Africa and India. The Africans were originally brought over as slaves, and the Indians came later as indentured workers. That means they agreed to come for a specific time, but many of them stayed. There are also some Trinidadians of Chinese and British origin, though the native inhabitants were basically wiped out by colonialization. I myself felt completely accepted and had the time of my life. The language everyone speaks is English, so there was no problem for me there, but some concepts don't quite translate. They're pure Trinidadian. There's the term liming, for example, which means sitting around watching the world go by. Also, there's the famous carnival, when the whole island is taken up in playing mass. For a whole month, around February or March, it depends when Easter is, Everyone's busy preparing costumes, practicing calypsos, soca and steel pan music, and most importantly, partying. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. When the actual official carnival starts, it's days of 24-hour dancing in the streets. In Trinidad, it's called whining. You've probably seen this sort of thing on TV, in the more famous carnival in Rio, or even at the Notting Hill Carnival in London. Many people join bands, each one of which has a theme. For example the sea or jungle fever, 
and they have costumes designed and made to go with the theme. These can cost $1,000 for the king and queen of each band. They're incredible. The whole city is a non-stop party zone, full of color and sound. It's serious, too. The bands are in competition, and the winner gets a million dollars. Sorry, I got a bit carried away with those memories. Back to my real job there. The orphanage was called St. Augustine's, and that's also the name of the place where it was, St. Augustine, a town just outside the capital city, Port of Spain. I didn't have any particular job description, just to be with the children and tell stories, sing songs and play games. Oh, and we also went camping in the jungle once. I could tell you a few stories about that particular escapade. Every time I arrived at the gate, kids would come running towards me, shouting, with big smiles on their faces. The younger children seemed fascinated by my blonde hair and loved to touch it as if it was something miraculous. The English teaching I did two days a week in a primary school for six to 11-year-olds. The kids may have been poor, but they all wore neat and clean uniforms and were so respectful and enthusiastic. I've now been teaching for many years in different countries, and I still think those were the best students I've ever taught. What else did I do while I was there? I swam a lot. Can you imagine what it's like swimming with dolphins and with pelicans diving into the sea right next to you? More seriously, I trained to be a Samaritan. That's someone who listens and supports people who have problems with their lives. Overall, what I took from the experience was a sense of being in another culture, or rather cultures. As humans, we all share many characteristics, but we express ourselves in various ways. In Trinidad, there are lots of different communities and religions, and so many different kinds of festival to see. Hindu, Muslim, Christian, as well as some rather mysterious African traditions. There are quite a few Rastafarians, too. Trinidad is, as Americans are fond of saying of their own country, a melting pot, where everybody is greeted warmly. Go and see for yourself. I'm not sure how it's changed since I was there, but I'd love to find out. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a group of students, Henry, Joe, Nancy, and Gordon, discussing changes to their work experience placement arrangements. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Look, there's the notice that Professor Jones told us he'd be putting up confirming the details of our work experience placements. But I thought that was already arranged. No, he said he'd have to check with the companies that the days we preferred were okay for them. Let's see if any have changed. Therese is not here today, but her name's first. It says the Uni Bookshop, Friday mornings starting on the 23rd of March. So nothing's changed. I'll let her know. What about Manuel? 
He's not here either. Is he still going to the music store in the high street? If it's mainly music, yes, he's still down for that on Friday afternoons starting on the 9th. Um, the day's different. It's changed from Tuesday mornings, but that's okay. I'll tell him. He'll really enjoy listening to music all day. Now, where's my name? Henry. Here it is. I'm going to the beauty shop, and I said I preferred Thursday afternoons. Oh, good, that seems okay. And my start date hasn't changed either. Joe, what day did you opt for? I'm going to Highway Hotels on Monday mornings. Yes, that's okay. And starting on Monday the 12th of March. Oh, has that been changed? Okay, I was scheduled to start the week before. I'll just make a note of that. What about me, Henry? Have I still got the Explore Travel Service on Wednesday mornings? Just a minute. Where's your name? Mm, let's see. Nancy. Okay, here it is. Explore Travel on Wednesdays, yes, but afternoons and starting date is Wednesday the 14th of March. Has the date changed? No, not the date, just the time, which is fine. I'll get to sleep in. You lazy thing, Nancy. Chris's name is next on the list. Gorgeous Gowns Fashions. What a name. Yes, it sounds good, doesn't it? I'm hoping he'll bring me some free samples. So, has he still got Wednesday mornings? Yes, Wednesday mornings starting on the 14th of March. OK, I'll tell him when I see him tonight that his arrangements haven't changed. Gordon, what about you? I chose that software company that makes computer games. I can't remember its name, but I asked for Tuesday afternoons. Oh, oh yes. Here it is. Games to go on Wednesday mornings. There's a note here saying they have their weekly staff meetings on Tuesday afternoons, so that wouldn't be much use to you. That's why they've changed it to Wednesdays, starting on the 21st of March, so you can see their working setup. OK, I'm glad they've changed it. I don't think I'd want to sit through a meeting every week. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now, as the conversation continues, answer questions 27 to 30. Can someone remind me what time we have to get to our placement in the afternoons? It says here, mornings start at 9am and afternoon sessions at 1pm. Oh, that's a shame. I thought Professor Jones was going to change it to 9.30am and 1.30pm. Yes, he did say that he'd try to make it later, but obviously that wasn't possible. By the way, just in case, what happens if we're ill or something and can't make it? Do we phone the college or the place we're going to? I think we have to phone the company first and then the college. Didn't you get the information sheet about work experience at our last seminar? No, I missed it because I had to go to the dentist. What else did it say? Well, we have to do a total of 24 hours altogether, so if we miss one of the arranged sessions, we have to organise another time to make up the hours. And he gave us details of the presentation we have to give about our work experience. Oh really? What do we have to do? In week 10, we each have to give a presentation to the class about the company we've been with. It's 30% of our final mark for this subject. So it's going to be a lot of work. Yes, he's expecting us to do a lot of research while we're there so that we can outline the history of the company, its management structure, number of employees, other branches, etc. 
and he said we should use lots of visuals such as diagrams and flowcharts during the presentation. Yes, and we should also include what we did each week, the different departments of the company or positions that we observed, and try to relate what we saw to our studies so far. He gave examples like management style, accounting systems, information technology, and so on. You were right. It sounds like lots of work. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a woman giving a talk at a popular science convention. She is describing research into artificial gills, designed to enable humans to breathe underwater. Now you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen, and answer questions thirty-one to forty. In my talk today, I'll be exploring the idea of artificial gills. I'll start by introducing the concept, giving some background, and so forth, and then I'll go on to explain the technological applications, including a short, very simple experiment I conducted. Starting with the background, as everyone knows. All living creatures need oxygen to live. Mammals take in oxygen from the atmosphere by using their lungs, and fishes take oxygen from water by means of their gills, which, of course, in most fishes, are located either side of their head. But human beings have always dreamt of being able to swim under water like the fishes, breathing without the help of oxygen tanks. I don't know whether any of you have done any scuba diving, but it's a real pain having to use all that equipment. You need special training, and it's generally agreed that tanks are too heavy and big to enable most people to move and work comfortably underwater. So scientists are trying a different tack. Rather than humans carrying an oxygen supply as they go underwater, wouldn't it be possible to extract oxygen in situ? That is directly from the water while swimming. In the 1960s, the famous underwater explorer Jacques Cousteau, for example, predicted that one day surgery could be used to equip humans with gills. He believed our lungs could be bypassed, and we would learn to live underwater just as naturally as we live on land. But of course, most of us would prefer not to go to such extremes. <laughs> I've been looking at some fairly simple technologies developed to extract oxygen from water, ways to produce a simple, practical artificial gill, enabling humans to live and breathe in water without harm. Now, how scientists and inventors went about this was to look at the way different animals handled this. Fairly obviously, they looked at the way fishes breathe. But also how they move down and float up to the surface using inflatable sacs called swim bladders. Scientists also looked at animals without gills, which use bubbles of air under water, notably beetles. These insects contrive to stay under water for long periods by breathing from this bubble, which they hold under their wing cases. By looking at these animal adaptations, inventors began to come up with their own artificial gills. 
Now, making a crude gill is actually rather easy, more straightforward. You take a watertight box, which is made of a material which is permeable to gas, that is, it allows it to pass through inwards and outwards. You then fill this with air, fix it to the diver's face, and go down under water. But a crucial factor is that the diver has to keep the water moving so that water high in oxygen is always in contact with the gill, so he can't really stay still. And to maximize this contact, it's necessary for your gill to have a big surface area. Different gill designers have addressed this problem in different ways, but many choose to use a network or lattice arrangement of tiny tubes as part of their artificial gills. Then the diver is able to breathe in and out. Oxygen from the water passes through the outer walls of the gill and carbon dioxide is expelled. In a nutshell, that's how the artificial gill works. So, having read about these simple gill mechanisms, I decided to create my own. I followed the procedure I've just described, and it worked pretty well when I tried it out in the swimming pool. I lasted underwater for nearly 40 minutes. However, I've read about other people breathing through their gill for several hours. So the basic idea works well, but the real limitation is that these simple gills don't work as the diver descends to any great depth because the pressure builds and a whole different set of problems are caused by that. Research is being done into how these problems might be overcome, but that's another story, which has to be a subject of another talk. <laughs> Despite this serious limitation, many people have high hopes for the artificial gill, and they think it might have applications beyond simply enabling an individual to stay underwater for a length of time. For example, the same technology might be used to provide oxygen for submarines, enabling them to stay submerged for months on end without resorting to potentially dangerous technologies such as nuclear power. Another idea is to use oxygen derived from the water as energy for fuel cells. These could power machinery underwater, such as robotic devices. So, in my view, this is an area of technology with great potential. Thank you.